Hi class, welcome to module 11. Today we're going to talk about the plant disease uh, triangle and management of plant disease by uh, taking different approaches to what the plant disease triangle tells us. And we have a special guest with us who's going to join us on the teaching today. This is Dr. Mary Helen Ferguson. Good morning. The great thing about it is Mary Helen is a real asset to the LSU Ag Center here because uh, she is a, an extension agent uh, but she also has her doctorate in plant pathology. So, I do. <laughs> welcome, Mary Helen, and thank you. Let's uh, dig right into this now. Uh, one thing which I like to point out to everyone when we're gardening is uh, that it takes some planning and some uh, processing and some ideas. As we mentioned before, like Benjamin Franklin said, if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail. And then I like to bring it in a little more. Someone that. Uh, a lot of us know, especially my generation, is the great UCLA basketball coach John Wooden, and he said, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So with that in mind, we're going to look at all the aspects that are involved in plant disease development in your gardens and different ways we can approach it to control uh, the disease and prevent disease in our gardens. Uh, the original uh, of the American Society for Horticulture, the uh, Dr. Liberty Hyde Ballet, I like what he says, that a garden requires patient labor and attention because plants do not merely grow uh, to satisfy ambitions or to fulfill good intentions. They thrive because someone expended effort on them. So having a successful garden is going to take some work and what we're trying to do is to help you look at ways you can approach it to get less work and more rewards. So, um, the, the plant disease triangle, uh, that's been around for a long time, Mary Helen. Uh, what, what do you kind of see that as? I know some people like to make it a pyramid, but I still like to stick with the triangle. Yeah. Why don't you tell our class kind of what that is? Well, so we have the susceptible host, which is our plant, um, a, a virulent pathogen or pathogen capable of infecting in a favorable favorable environment. You need all of those things to have plant disease. The fourth thing that people sometimes add uh, to make it a pyramid, which actually you need another side for a pyramid, I think, but um, <laughs> yes. you would be time. But I think that's kind of a given, um, that, you know, mm -hmm. that it takes time for disease to develop. So, um, you know, something that if you, if you have a situation where you have a problem in your garden and it developed overnight. I mean, and, and a lot of people think something developed overnight, but it's because they weren't watching it. But if it really did <laughs> develop overnight and it doesn't progress, it doesn't get worse, that's probably not a biological agent because diseases, um, biological agents take time and they progress. So symptoms progress and they spread. If it's something like cold injury, it happens one time. It happens at once. Uh, lightning damage to a tree, it happens at once. Um, so that's just something to think about. If you're trying to figure out what's wrong, um, sometimes looking at the, the spread or lack thereof is an important aspect of figuring out whether it's a biological agent or disease or just some sort of nutrient disorder or environmental disorder. Yeah, Mary Ellen, we've covered that in some classes, as you guys may remember, but it's a good point that Mary Ellen's bringing up is that you got to know what you're dealing with. Even if it is a disease, if you're dealing with a bacterial disease and you treat it like a fungal disease, then you're not going to get any uh, good results. So um, identify, identify, identify. The, it's kind of like our uh, mantra when we were talking about collecting seeds and growing your own seedlings. Label, label, label. Because sure enough, if you don't label something, you're going to forget what it is. Mm. And the same thing with uh, diseases. If you don't know what you're dealing with, uh, you might be wasting your time, your money, and watching all your plants die. If you call us and just say, what can I spray on my plant? It looks bad. No, <laughs> we, we have to know more than that. We have to find out more than that. Uh, yeah, I, I like that you're saying that, Marilyn, because people will go to their doctor with uh, physical ailments and diseases. and they don't mind the doctor asking them all kinds of questions and and going into great detail before he actually gives them an answer to what might be the problem and what they can do about it. But it seems like whenever we're dealing with plants and plant diseases, uh, you get a call and say, my tomato has black spots on the leaves, what can I do? And there's just so much information still missing. So. Okay. 
Remember that when you're dealing with uh, plant pathologists, we're going to treat it like a doctor. <laughs> we're there to help you take care of your plants. So what we're going to do in this class is approach controlling disease from maybe a little different angle than uh, what you may have heard or used. We're not going to say, okay, this is your disease, you go out there and spray it. We're going to tell you, okay, as Mary Helen pointed out with the disease triangle, unless you have all three components there, a susceptible host, a virulent pathogen, and a conducive environment, one that's favorable for disease development, you're not going to get disease. So we're going to take a look at those three different links, uh, environment, pathogen, and host, and examine different ways that you can break that link at some point. Because if you break the link of either one of those at some point, you're going to prevent disease or stop it from occurring. So um, we're going to first take a look at uh, environmental conditions. And one of those conditions is air temperature. And right off the bat, you're going to think, what can I do to control the air temperature? That's something I can't control. But we want you to be thinking innovatively and really thinking about this whole process because there are some things you can do to control air temperature. One of them is, when are you planting your plants? If you're growing the right crops in the right season, then you're actually doing something to control the air temperature in that particular time frame where you're growing in plants because cool season crops grown in cool season, the air temperature is going to be cool. Warm season crops grown in warm season, the air is going to be warm. So planting in the right season is one way to control air temperature. Uh, a second way would be to uh, think about where you're planting your plants. Uh, if you're planting them near a building, then it's going to be warmer. That microclimate is going to be warmer all the time. Uh, they're going to be protected from the cold if it gets a little cooler. And especially if it's a, a dark colored building, then that building is going to absorb radiant energy and give off heat mm -hmm. later on, especially in the evening. So it's going to stay warmer. If you're planting near a light colored building, it might actually help to make things a little cooler because it's going to reflect the sun. So those are two ways you can actually control uh, the air temperature. And that would be one way to break that environmental link. Uh, you know, we often think of Louisiana as just being the prime spot for plant diseases, you know, wet and hot. But there's actually a number of diseases that do better at cooler temperatures compared to what we have during our growing season. So, um, well, we talked about planting time. And I think one example there is tomato pith necrosis. So this is something, tomato pith necrosis is something we don't see every year. Don't see it all that much yeah. but um if you plant early when you have cool nights and especially if you have a lot of nitrogen fertilizer in there it's growing fast that's something that tends to occur occur earlier in the season when you have cool temperatures and then um i work with strawberry growers and botrytis is a big problem gray mold is a big problem in strawberries as it is with um, many other crops and plants and that's something that tends to occur at cooler temperatures, so around 65 to 75 Fahrenheit. And so, for example, you can get botrytis on tomatoes, but we don't see it a lot because we're growing it at a very hot time of year. If you're growing it in a greenhouse in the winter, you know, trying to keep it just minimally warm for warm enough for growth, then you tend to get more botrytis in a greenhouse, actually. So there's something in the late blight of tomato. Um, late blight's the thing that caused the Irish potato famine. Um, we don't see that as much as some people do because the time of the year when we're growing tomatoes particularly, we don't have the favorable temperatures. It's too hot actually here for favorable temperatures for, for late blight. So we actually are in a good shape, good, good position in some cases. And, um, so. so Louisiana environment isn't ideal for everything. Not ideal for everything. When we talk about soil temperature, uh, verticillium wilt is another one that we don't see typically because it's actually too hot. Uh, it does better in soils that are a little bit cooler. Mm -hmm. So that's something that um, some places have big problems with. Kind of like we have problems with Phytophthora and Fusarium and stuff in the soil. Some places have verticillium wilt problems. We don't tend to have uh, Yeah. So soil temperature is another of those environmental links that you can break by doing some things to control it. As Mary Ellen was just saying, plenty of things at the right season. Uh, if you want to try to get a jump on tomatoes, in the year and you're planting them out when it's still cool, you, you're taking the risk of getting a pith necrosis because it likes the cooler temperatures. So choosing the right uh, planting time will 
also have determined what soil temperature you're planting in. So that's okay. one way you can control soil temperature. Uh, once again, where you plant things uh, will have some effect on soil temperature. Even how you grow things. If you're growing in containers or raised beds, then the soil temperature tends to be closer to what ambient air temperature is because of the elevated conditions and the air is all around a smaller uh, unit of soil. So the soil temperatures will actually be warmer usually in raised beds or containers if it's warm outside, cooler if it's cool outside. Whereas if you're growing in ground, uh, the whole effect of, I guess you could say, the entire uh, earth is helping to mediate that drastic change in temperature. So soil is usually uh, less affected by drastic changes in the air temperature if you're growing in ground. And one other way, you've heard us talk about it for many different reasons, but another way you control soil temperature is using mulches uh, and the color mulches. You know how that... Uh, like, like reflective mulches? Yes, yeah. yeah, like the lighter colored mulches are going to keep the soil cooler than the dark colored mulches because as Marilyn said, reflective mulches, uh, you can even use aluminum, I've seen that used as a mulch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Quite reflective, or light colored mulches, they're going to reflect the, the temperature, the, the sun, and, and your soil is going to stay cooler, and just mulches in general are going to keep your soil cooler, so that's one way you can help to control the soil temperature, is using mulches. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that you can keep the soil cooler, but you can actually have it even warmer if you use dark mulches. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, especially yeah. like black plastic mulches. Mm -hmm. So not only can you keep the soil cooler, you can actually keep the soil warmer if you want. Yeah. Uh, and another environmental condition is rainfall. So Mary Helen, what, people think, okay, there's no way I'm going to control rainfall. So what do you tell them about maybe how you might, there's different ways that you might approach controlling the rainfall. Well, I mean, well, first of all, this affects what we grow well here. You know, there's a lot of things that um, we, that, you know, California produces a lot of vegetables, partly because they don't get a ton, much, nearly as much rainfall as we do, and overhead water, they don't have much disease pressure for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as how you can actually affect effective rainfall in your garden, well, that's difficult. Um, but one thing that comes to mind is that, well, if you plant next to a house, and you have uh, don't have gutters, then the effective rainfall on the bed right next to your house is going to be a tremendous amount more mm -hmm. than it would be out in the open. So this actually, so I think about rainfall and I think about foliar diseases because we tend to get disease development where we have free moisture on leaves for a time, for a period of time. Um, but when we talk about things like phytophthora root rot, which is a huge problem here, um, when we have that amount of rainfall going onto a bed next to a house without a gutter, um, that could affect what is going to grow well next to a house. So that, that definitely affects the effect of rainfall. You mentioned shelters and things. and um, one So high tunnels are something used in commercial oh, production yeah. sometimes. And they'll use to extend the season to keep things a little bit warmer, go a little bit later in the season and start a little bit earlier. But they can also be used to protect plants from overhead water. Um, and per perhaps prevent foliar disease. I knew a grower who actually was using a high tunnel, started using high tunnels primarily to prevent foliar disease in his tomatoes because he was trying to grow organically. Um, so that's just, in, you know, something you're probably not going to do in a home garden. You perhaps could. Um, but just a couple of thoughts. Why don't you give the students a quick uh, idea of what a high tunnel is? That's probably something some of them have never heard of before. A high tunnel is basically an unheated greenhouse, and a lot of times you'll have um, open ends. Now, you can put ends on it, but it's basically a shelter. Now, it will come down to the ground. The plastic will come down to the ground on the sides, but you can, growers will push that up during the daytime when it's warm in order to get air movement through there. So, unlike a greenhouse, which can keep out insects and, you know, gives you, you, you would typically have active heating or cooling in a greenhouse, um, a high tunnel is passive heating, cooling, um, just a, a shelter um, to, from, the, from the rain and mm -hmm. to give you a few degrees of protection. They're more popular in places where it gets a little bit colder and it allows them to go later or start earlier with their produce. But um, rain protection is one aspect of that. 
Hmm. One thing, you know, we um, talked about a little bit ago, so powdery mildew is this the huh. one disease <laughs> that tends to be worse when you don't have overhead water. So you still need high humidity, but it's actually worse in places where they don't have a lot of free moisture, overhead water. And so sometimes if you're growing in a high tunnel or a greenhouse, you, you may end up with more issues with that because you don't have that overhead moisture. So most of foliar diseases you're probably going to have less of in a high tunnel, um, but powdery mildew would be an exception. And, and, and if you had it so that it, you didn't have good air circulation, you could get really high humidity and might have some problems related to that. But. Yeah, as Mary Ellen mentioned, a lot of the diseases like high humidity uh, to develop. And she was just mentioning it. How, how, did, how could you control the relative humidity in Grand Louisiana? It seems like it's 100% all the time. But <laughs> you can actually, um, depending on what time of year you're growing, you can have some effect on the relative humidity mm -hmm. in the area where your plants are. If you think about it, just if you're in a crowded room, you tend to get a lot warmer and it seems a little sticky if there's a lot of people around. Which we aren't doing right now with the <laughs> with the, the <laughs> protective distancing. But think back when that was, and it's the same effect whenever you have your plants growing close to each other, because all that foliage, as the moisture goes into the gaseous phase, as there's evaporation, humidity starts to develop. Well, if there's no air movement and all the plants are close together, the relative humidity in that microclimate is going to be much higher than the surrounding air humidity. So okay. one way you can reduce that humidity is space your plants out. I mean, Mary Helen was just mentioning it about having airflow. So planting the plants further apart, you're going to increase the airflow. There's not going to be as much humidity trapped. Um, planting them near uh, barriers, you're going to reduce the airflow. And if you reduce the airflow, you're going to have increased humidity. So um, plant your garden out in the open where there's free air movement. Uh, it almost always is a good thing. I don't know. I can't think of any any situation where free airflow is a bad thing for plants. Right, <laughs> Maybe right. I'm missing something. Unless you're trying to protect, you know, give cold protection to citrus or something. But, you know, another thing, talk about humidity and airflow is it pruning. And one thing oh, we do yeah. when we prune perennial plants, um, fruit plants, and trees and stuff um, is to open it up in the middle and it's not just to reduce humidity but it's all it's to get more light in for more production on the inside of the plant and to allow better spray penetration if we're going to spray but also we get better air movement and um, the leaves tend to dry off faster when they're wet and then you know you may have lower humidity because of that air movement yeah that's that's really good and Mary Ellen's mentioned irrigation a couple times you're going to hear us probably several times throughout this presentation and throughout the course, talk about irrigation and how important it is how you irrigate and even when you irrigate. Because if you think about um, the humidity uh, and irrigation, the time of day you irrigate is really, really important. If you're irrigating uh, late in the evening. Which many people do. Yes, so because they, they come home from work and they think, right. okay, my plants need water and I'm gonna go ahead and water them. Wow. And, and it is a good thing in terms of water conservation. You know, you're not out there at noon spreading water in the air with a sprinkler and having more of it evaporate, but you're getting water on the leaves that may stay there all night long and give diseases a chance to develop. Yeah. So early morning. Early morning, yes. If you're going to use a sprinkler. Like Mary Ellen said, you know, if you got them growing in a good area with where they're going to get sunlight and airflow, well, then when you irrigate early in the morning, the leaves, if, you, if they do get wet, are going to dry much better much faster than if you water late in the evening so as much as possible try to avoid late evening watering and irrigation and if you have to do it you know try to water to the base of the plant if, we're, if you're doing drip irrigation if you have a um what do you call the hoses the soaker hoses, soaker hoses you know yeah. that's that's a different situation you're not getting water on the leaves of the plant that's true that's true Though you will still increase the humidity around the plant True. anytime you add water. True. So be thinking about that. And speaking of irrigation, that's the way you're controlling soil moisture. That's another environmental component that you do have control over in, in a lot of sick cases yeah. is the soil moisture. Uh, because when you're irrigating, how much you irrigate, how often you irrigate, and when you irrigate has a big effect on the, on the soil moisture. Right. 
yeah, and you know, when we talk about um, soil moisture, we, of course we don't want to over irrigate. We would predispose our plants to root rots and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, we don't, but we want to have adequate water. You know, even something like phytops or root rot, which we get on many, many of our plants, different species affect like different plants. Um, and that is favored by high level of soil moisture. But if your plants get water stressed before they get exposed to those pathogen spores, it actually can make them more susceptible to that. So it may seem counterintuitive because it's a, a disease that's favored by high soil moisture. But if you have drought stressed plants or water stressed plants, they may be actually more likely to get infected. So mm -hmm. um, not having plants get stressed out by uh, low soil moisture is important as well. Mm -hmm. And talking about soil moisture now, if you want to, if you're in the hot part of the year and you want to retain that soil moisture, two things you can do to increase the soil moisture uh, retention is mulching. There it comes up again. The depth of the mulch, always have at least two inches of, of mulch depth if you're going to use it. Otherwise, you're just decorating. It's not going to really do what it's supposed to do. Uh, so you want to use at least two inches of mulch, and that's going to help to retain some of the soil moisture because the, you're not going to have as much evaporation from the soil surface. And if you remember from the soils classes early on, uh, increasing the organic matter in your soil will help to increase uh, water retention capacity. So uh, by adding organic matter, you're going to be able to keep uh, soil moisture where you want it, in the soil mm -hmm. and available to the plants. We talk about raised beds here, um, you know, that, that is something that's very important for regarding some of our root rot. So if I hop through a root rot, come back to you again, we have some <laughs> blueberries back here that are a little bit more raised than some of our other plants and um, the rabbit eye blueberries that we have traditionally planted in the south are a little more tolerant or maybe resistant to by top to it in those southern high bush plants that um, are grown more commercially in Georgia and North Carolina and places. But for all of them, having good drainage is an important thing. So having it building up a raised bed and uh, maybe tilling in some pine bark mulch and stuff. But mm -hmm. raised beds are a good way. Even think growing things. Um, we recently were doing an herbs class and something like rosemary that is from a Mediterranean environment an area that has a lot less more rainfall than we typically do. I think, you know, something like that would be important to put in a raised bed if you want it to survive for a number of years. Yeah. As Mary Ellen mentioned, we were just talking about the rainfall. Drainage, that's really important for almost all, all plants is to have good drainage. Right. There's Not some there. things, I mean, citrus, for example, um, you know, it, it tolerates more soil moisture than some of our fruit crops particularly, but mm -hmm. um, some things are more, peaches just do not tolerate soil moisture. So some things are more sensitive, but there's very, very few plants where we're going to be like, put that in a poorly drained area, especially amongst <laughs> our fruit and vegetable crops. Yeah, there are a few plants that they use to help to get rid of the water faster in areas, like our cypress trees, mm -hmm. you know, where they can grow in, in heavily wet soils and through transpiration they will help to get rid of that water faster so they'll drain it but most plants nah they don't like it they want their roots dry right. but moisture available right. kind, of, kind of finicky guys yeah. <laughs> oh. and of course that's not just related to disease that's also related to oxygenation of the roots because roots have to yes. survive but um but it definitely Soil moisture definitely influences a lot of our soil-borne diseases. Mm -hmm. And as far as the soil-borne diseases, sometimes particular soil types are more favorable to a certain disease than others, right. like uh, heavy clay soils or soils that are um, extremely high in organic matter. Organic matter is usually a good thing, but sometimes you can get organic matter much too high so right. uh, you can actually affect your soil type Do you remember back when we talked about soils by putting in soil amendments you can add sand uh, to increase drainage you can add clay or organic matter to increase uh, the CEC or cation exchange capacity to increase the water retention capacity by adding those two so you're changing your soil type by doing that or you can just grow and raise beds and then you're deciding what soil type you have right from the very beginning. Right. Whatever you start with is what you're going to have. Right. So that's important. 
Another port, important soil component is pH. So why don't you tell our class something about <laughs> soil pH and what we can do about that? Well, I see on our slide we have lime and sulfur, and we typically use lime to raise our pH and sulfur to reduce our pH. Um, in most of our garden plants, like a pH around six or six and a half, um, there are exceptions, certainly. Things like blueberries, centipede turf grass, camellias, gardenias, azaleas, um, like something more acidic. But there are situations where this doesn't just affect the general health of the plant. And the general health of the plant, of course, is important in terms of it being able to, you know, be, just being generally healthy. We, we tend to get sick when we're stressed and, and run down and stuff. But also, there are specific ways that certain diseases are affected by soil pH. So things like potato scab, so it doesn't occur below pH 5.2. Now, below pH 5.2 is not the ideal pH for potatoes necessarily, but if you have a lot of potato scab pressure, they do suggest reducing your pH below 5.2, which is very acidic. Mm -hmm. um, and if, uh, another example would be southern blight. So I'm sure a lot of, some of you have experienced this. You have southern blight is this fungal disease that we get on things like tomatoes, um, peppers, sometimes on green beans. It affects a lot of different vegetable crops. And it's a real problem for some people in home gardens sometimes because there's not a lot in the way of chemical solutions for that. And there's not a lot in the way in re plant resistance either. Um, but one thing is that that, that the structure that overwinters, uh, the sclerotia for southern blight, for that fungus, um, does not germinate at a pH higher than about seven. Now, we're typically not gonna lime our soils to be higher than seven, at least on where I work. Now, down <laughs> here, you may, your, your pH may be higher than seven. It but is. Um, Okay, so, so that's good for you, but <clears throat> if you, um, you're gonna be more predisposed to having problems with the southern blight disease if your pH is below maybe six or so. So if you can, if you're gonna grow tomatoes or something, you're gonna probably, well, if you're, if you're from the North Shore or farther up on the North Shore, um, you are probably gonna have to lime anyway to get it into the recommended range for a lot of vegetables. Um, if you can get up to about six and a half, maybe you may kind of reduce your chances that you're gonna get as much southern blight pressure. So southern blight, you're going to see like white fungal growth right at the base of the stem near the soil and you see these mustard seed sized little structures. Those are the sclerotia, the overwintering structures. Um, so it's a pretty easy disease to identify if you have it. Um, so, so pH affects that. And so we have high pH being favorable to not having southern blight and low pH being favorable to not having potato scab. So different ways that different things affect different diseases. Right. So your soil pH, depending on what you're dealing with, uh, you can control it by, as we told you in the soils, you know, use sulfur as a, as a common way of lowering your pH, using lime as a common way, as Mary Helen mentioned, to raise the pH. And so, depends on what disease problems you're having is whether you may want to raise your pH or lower your pH. And as you guys may remember from uh, the soils lecture, how do you know what your pH is uh, in your soil? Well, the best way is to do a soil test. Uh, send it to the lab. Remember the, the LSU Ag Center mantra, don't guess, soil test. Right. <laughs> and that soil test will also tell you about something about the soil fertility. And Mary Helen mentioned it a while ago, uh, plants like people, we tend to be more susceptible to diseases when we're stressed and under stressful situations. And one of the way plants are stressed is if they aren't being properly nourished, if they aren't getting the nutrients they need uh, to produce all the food they need and all the rest of the biological uh, and biochemical components that make up their whole life. If they're being stressed on by nutrients, they are going to be more susceptible to diseases. And we can control the nutrient level in our soils by adding fertilizers, organic or chemical fertilizers, by increasing the organic matter, um, by adjusting the pH. As we told you in the soils lecture that uh, the availability of certain nutrients is greatly affected by the soil pH. And so by adjusting the soil pH, you, know, you make those nutrients available to your plants. And if they're available, the plant's gonna be healthier, under less stress, and it's gonna be a happier plant, more able to resist diseases. Mm -hmm. And I know Mary Helen's mentioned several times about soil aeration. Um, by having good drainage and good soil texture where you have a lot of pores, micropores and macropores, you're going to increase the, the aeration in the soil. Plant roots need the oxygen to survive. 
A lot of the microbes growing in the soil, which help, uh, they actually help the plants defend off disease sometimes by out-competing them, and yeah. Or sometimes they'll even play an active role in protecting the plant mm -hmm. and the plant roots from diseases. Yeah. Well, mostly they're favorable, favored by good soil aeration. Mm -hmm. So you definitely don't want compacted soils. And one thing, talking about soil fertility, you mentioned we want adequate nutrition, but you can get um, favoring of disease by excess nutrients too. So especially nitrogen, sometimes we'll see diseases being favored by high nitrogen levels. Um, you know, sometimes we think if some is good, more is better. But like the pithnicosis we talked about earlier, that tends to occur more when you have excess nitrogen in the soil. And with some diseases, um, the form of nitrogen can affect the <laughs> disease. So ammonium versus nitrate form. And off the top of my head, um, I have a hard time remembering specific examples, but they have done studies showing that sometimes you do get favoring of disease by one form or another. Um, and then high salt. So sometimes we, especially when people use like manure or like manure-based compost, sometimes mm -hmm. we'll end up with high salt levels in the soil. And high salt levels can um, predispose plants to some diseases too. So that's just something to watch out for. If you're using manure and stuff, you want to be careful about not overdoing that and soil testing to make sure you're not building up phosphorus and salt levels and, and micronutrient levels and stuff that are too high. Yeah. So give your plants as much of a stress-free life as possible and uh, they're going to be able to resist a lot of the diseases that you may normally encounter. Okay, now we've talked about breaking the um, environmental link in controlling disease. And here, here you guys can see we got the, the disease triangle up again. Uh, so now, um, as we go into the second link, the, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we consider breaking that pathogen link. That's one thing that uh, you can do is you can break that pathogen link. So we're going to kind of go through it and talk a little bit about breaking that pathogen link. Um, but Mary Helen mentioned it earlier. Uh, one thing you want to make sure when you're looking at plant disease is, do I have a plant disease, uh, a biotic condition going on here, something that's caused by living organisms? Uh, we used to call them abiotic diseases. I think they now call them abiotic disorders. I like disorders better. <laughs> yeah, because that's really, really what it is. Um, but we talked about it in the plant nutrition class and here you see it again on on the slide that you're seeing is nutrient deficiencies will often look like plant diseases uh, but, but go ahead and tell them man and you mentioned consistent. it earlier what make uh, what how, what's one good way of knowing whether or at least giving you a clue whether you have an abiotic disorder or a plant disease well earlier we talked about progress over time and, and mm -hmm. in fact um, nutrient deficiencies could start to look worse over time as the plant grows and becomes more deficient in that in that nutrient. Um, but nutrient deficiencies and herbicide injury and stuff like that will tend to be more consistent. And you know, biological things tend to be random, and you know, not every plant is necessarily going to be affected. It may be kind of here, or there. Um, but with things like nutrient deficiencies and herbicide injury, if it's something you know in a soil then it's maybe fairly consistent among your plants. So consistency is something that gives us a clue that it may be more likely to be a non-living cause. Mm -hmm. And as Mary Helen mentioned, uh, spread. That's also sometimes a real clue as to whether you're dealing with a disease, uh, plant, biotic plant disease or an abiotic disorder. If you have a plant that's looking really bad and it's amongst a bunch of healthy looking plants, and just that one plant stays looking bad and the rest seem unaffected, then that kind of makes you think that you probably got a, uh, an abiotic disorder that's affecting that because it's not spreading from one plant to the next. Well, on the, at the same time, if, if we're talking about, let's say, a, a bed of tomatoes and there's mm -hmm. just one plant that's wilted, that's usually going to be bacterial wilt or southern blight. Usually. Um, but I would tend to think more biological if it's just one because the others aren't affected. And if it was a nutrient disorder and we, you know, we've applied the same amount of fertilizer over the bed um, mm -hmm. or, you know, we've had the same general amount of rainfall, stuff like that. In that case, I would think more disease, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but there's a lot of 
factors to consider. <laughs> like, like we said earlier, the doctor is going to ask you a lot of questions before they actually diagnose what's going on. Uh, so, and we're talking about nutrient deficiency, but there are other things that can uh, make you think that there's plant disease going on. Uh, air pollution is one that I don't see very often unless you're in a, uh, some of the higher urban areas where there's a lot of air pollution. That can have very, very similar symptoms as you can see on the slides here. Uh, air pollution can look like disease. Um, one that I know I get calls about, and you maybe too from homeowners, is um, scorching, sun scorching and, and, and burning of, of fruits and, and even leaves sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just because of the intense heat uh, intense uh, solar radiation that's burning the plant, especially veggies. If you're growing veggies and your plant doesn't have a lot of leaf cover, as the fruit grows and starts to develop, the plant isn't putting a canopy over it with its leaves to protect it from the sun. And as the, sun, as the fruit gets larger, the surface is more uh, heated by the sun, and you can get sunburn on your your fruits. One, one clue that you're dealing with sunburn is if the primary fruits on your plant that are affected are those that are exposed to the sun. Mm -hmm. The ones facing the sun, especially right. the, the early afternoon, late evening hot sun, if those are the fruits that are primary, primarily affected then that could be a clue that you're dealing with sunburn rather than uh, some other type of disease. Bell peppers are a big one, their sun's called. Mm -hmm. So, if you determine that you do have a biotic uh, plant disease going on, that could be caused, as uh, you've heard us talk about before, your, and that there's fungi, fungi-like organisms, bacteria, phytoplasmas, um, viruses, viroids, nematodes, even higher parasitic plants can all cause plant disease. So. There's a whole gamut of different organisms that can cause disease. However, there are some common approaches that you can do uh, to break that pathogen link, okay. regardless of what type of pathogen you're dealing with. That's right. And so we're going to tell you a few of those uh, things that you might think about uh, to break that pathogen link. Well. I mean, we may be covering it in another slide or so, but one thing to um, talk about is just getting clean plants from the start. So making sure you're not buying yes. plants that already have disease or have insect infestations. Yeah, and you can uh, guarantee yourself by looking for certified seed. And you can even, there are even certified plants. Certified, that is an important term uh, because what's going on, if it says it's been certified disease free, there are government agencies and testing labs that have tested that particular seed lot or those particular plants for uh, diseases that are known to affect those plants and those seed. And they have uh, different ways of testing, but what they do is they test them and say, yes, these seed or these plants are free from the more common diseases that might uh, occur with this particular plant, say with tomatoes. Uh, they been certified disease free, then most of the common diseases aren't currently present on those plants uh, when you buy them. So looking for that term certified is, is a good way. And of course you can do your own examination. And some, it. Sometimes it's hard to find plants that have been, you know, quote, quote unquote certified. Um, but there are specific examples like Louisiana is home to one of the sweet potato propagation programs where they do um, virus testing and they culture it from tissue culture where they actually take just a few cells you know under a microscope put it on uh, artificial media and grow that plant up in tissue culture with the idea being that the viruses which is mainly what you're trying to control for there um, do not get into the very very tip of that growing tip the apical meristem the very last few cells and so when for, for example people will place orders through us in January to get seed potatoes and those potatoes are I can't remember exactly how many generations from tissue culture but as it, opposed to if you were to go out and just um, get a potato from the store a sweet potato or from your neighbor 
um, that may already have some virus infection. And sometimes you won't see symptoms of that until you get multiple viruses together. Um, but it could still be reducing your yield. Um, blackberries are another one where we want to be real careful about virus infections. Um, they tend to get a lot of viruses. And so if you can buy blackberry plants that have come from one of these um, virus index programs, um, as opposed to taking a cutting um, from somebody or something, you may be saving yourself some trouble. Yeah. So uh, depending on what you're growing, sometimes, Mary Helen, as Mary Helen said, you're much better off purchasing your plants from disease-free facilities instead of just uh, taking cuttings from your neighbor. Uh, so something you maybe heard us say before, and I'm sure you're going to hear us say it multiple times, is a really good way of gardening healthy and growing healthy plants that are disease-free is start clean and stay clean. So getting disease-free seeds and plants is a way to start clean. And now, ways of staying clean, well, remove the plant debris around your plants. Keep it clean under and around your plants from the fallen leaves and if fruit happens to drop off and rot. Get rid of that as soon as you can because those organic tissue from the plant that you're growing can uh, harbor disease organisms. and. Sometimes once the leaf drops off or the fruit drops off, it's actually easier for the organisms to grow on those uh, dropped leaves and fruits. And then, as we told you with fungi, they make spores. And those spores can easily be transferred through rain splashing or other mechanisms to your healthy plants. So staying clean, uh, one of those is keep it clean under your plant, remove the the, the plant debris. Now I'm not talking about mulch. Mulch is still good. Right. Just get rid of that plant debris that's falling off of your plants. Don't leave it messy. Well, you mentioned mulch and mulch can actually help you because it can prevent splash of soil particles in the soil onto your plants. So for some diseases that are soil borne or overwinter in the soil, if you can prevent splash of that soil back onto the plant, that may help you in some cases. That mulch can be helpful. That's very true, very true. So mulch is a good thing, keep that in mind. And another thing, okay, <laughs> I've been guilty of this myself, is you have five tomato plants or something like that growing in your garden and one of them starts to show a little bit of disease. And <laughs> being a plant pathologist, sometimes I wanna say, oh, maybe I can do something to save it or to cure it. I wanna, I wanna see what happens here with the plant. Okay, don't do like <laughs> I just said I do. One way to help keep your garden healthy is as soon as you see a plant that has disease, especially once, once it's been diagnosed, say, uh, especially uh, something that uh, was probably going to spread to your other plants, as soon as you see that you have diseased plants, get rid of them. And get rid of them not by putting them in the compost pile. Uh, some diseases are killed by the composting process, but that is usually uh, when the composting is very much monitored and you got these increases in temperature, okay. you're monitoring the aeration of the compost pile. Professional mulch companies, they do all that and that eliminates a lot of plant pathogenic organisms from compost. But if you're just doing a compost pile at home, you're probably not paying that much attention to it, uh, not going through all the testing, Turning, the record keeping. That, yeah, so. When you remove those diseased plants, don't put them in your compost pile. Put them in the, the garbage to be taken away and gotten rid of. So get rid of those diseased plants as quickly as you can. I see we're talking about um, controlling insect vectors here. And can, can, so some of our diseases do, are spread by insects, particularly viral diseases. A lot of our viral diseases are spread by things like aphids or white flies. Not all of them. Um, but also some bacterial diseases. So Dalella fastidiosa, which is one of the reasons we don't grow a lot, some of the um, wine grapes here, like Chardonnay and Mer Merlot. Uh, one, one of the reasons we don't, uh, or, or don't often and well. Uh, so there, there's this in, these insects that spread these certain pathogens. And there are cases where managing the insects can help you. For example, tomato spotted wilt virus, 
Um, people have found that using reflective mulch, so uh, metallic mulch, can actually help repel thrips and reduce transmission of um, tomato spotted wilt virus in some cases. But there's a lot of cases where if you would come out and spray an insecticide for the purpose of controlling the vector insect, um, it's not necessarily going to do a lot. It depends all on how long it takes, well I say all, it depends like some, to some extent on how long it takes for that insect to transmit that pathogen to that plant or, or to mm -hmm. pick it up from a plant. So some insect pathogen systems will have, like they'll be able to transmit it within maybe just a few seconds or a few minutes. In some cases it takes longer feeding. So if you go out and spray an insecticide to control aphids for a viral disease that is spread very, very quickly when that insect probes that plant, you can actually cause more spread of the disease because that insecticide may cause the insects to move more. Um, and so it's, it's controlling insect vectors is not always a, way, a good way to control diseases. In some cases, it is. Yeah. Um once again, going back to identify, if the disease you're dealing with is one that the vector has to feed for, let's say, 15 minutes or so on a plant before it can either acquire the virus uh, or the phytoplasma, or once it is acquired it, if it has to feed for an extended period of time on the plant before it can transmit that virus to the plant, then controlling the vector is a good way to control the virus spread because uh, you're stopped. If, if you're stopping the insect from feeding for that long period of time, then it's not going to be able to either acquire the disease or to spread it. And But if it's one that spreads quickly, um, all it's got to do is stick its proboscis in the plant and suddenly the virus is transferred, then controlling the vector is um, on the particular host is not a good idea. But you can still control vectors and diseases. Um, this is going to be coming up in another uh, class is talking about weeds and weed control. Um, if you have a, a pretty clean garden, once again, start clean, stay clean. If you're keeping your garden kind of weed free, um, that can, in, in many instances, help to uh, reduce disease incidence because the weeds themselves may be harboring either the disease or insect vectors that transmit a disease. Um, it not, this is not necessarily just with virus diseases, fungal diseases. They right. may be growing on, on the weeds, right. producing spores that are gonna then spread to your uh, garden plants, the That's ones right. you're trying to grow. So another way of breaking that pathogen link is, it's almost like an alternate food source. You're right. getting rid of that right. alternate food source by getting rid of the weeds. And that's, we call it an alternative host of the mm -hmm. pathogen. If the fungus or virus or whatever infects the weed, it is an alternative host for that weed. And uh, we're going to talk to you about different families of vegetables uh, and plants uh, later on in the course, but knowing the different families is important for one of the things I know we talked that a lot especially with professional growers is crop rotation right Mary Helen absolutely and this is so important in home gardens in terms of vegetable plant disease management so so often we get called about people having um, bacterial wilt one of these soil borne diseases or and even some of the foliar diseases things um, things like our early blight it can overwinter on plant residue in the soil mm -hmm. so rotating where in the garden you plant a particular type of crop is very important because you don't have you know some commercial growers if they want to can go in and fumigate soil um, for diseases and, and various problems um, but in a home garden you're you have limited options in terms of managing some of these things um, in terms of chemical control and we'd rather not have to rely on chemical control anyway so crop rotation is very important yeah and what Marilyn talking about, which says, you know, crop rotation is the families of plants. So crop rotation, you're going to learn a lot about this in a, in a few more lessons, but crop rotation doesn't mean like growing tomatoes in the spot one year and next year, okay, I'm going to rotate out and I'm going to grow peppers. That's not crop rotation because peppers and tomatoes are in the same family. So when we talk about plant families, uh, especially dealing with vegetables later on, you'll see what we're talking about, but uh, crop rotation uh, primarily refers to rotating families 
of plants that you're growing. That's true. Um, I mean, and that's kind of a rule of thumb. Unfortunately, like some of these diseases, like southern blight, um, will affect plants in a lot of different families. True. And then there are some things that will only affect uh, tomatoes and not peppers. You know, there are, but it's a good rule of thumb to rotate by plant family. So your your nightshade plants, your tomatoes and peppers and eggplant, um, your your cucurbit plants, your pumpkins and cucumbers and things. So because things in the same family tend to be susceptible to the same diseases. Mm -hmm. And, and it makes it easy easy to rotate if all you're having to think about are families. Right. So doing the crop rotation, um, that that's that's important because what you're what you're essentially doing is um, that disease causing organism that is trying to survive in the soil. Well, you're not giving it any food, so you're starving it to death. Yeah. And, and you can follow you can follow a bed for a year. That's you true. Know, not plant anything. Just don't grow anything. And generally. So corn is our one grass crop amongst all, most of the vegetables we grow. There may be something I'm not thinking of, but corn tends to be, if we have a, a disease that affects a lot of different families of vegetables, sometimes corn is the thing that you might put in to kind of break that cycle. It doesn't tend to be, it's a monocot, it doesn't tend to be susceptible to as many of the same diseases. Very true. And who doesn't like sweet corn? fresh sweet corn right out of the garden. So <laughs> you're not sacrificing anything by rotating and using corn. Uh, another <clears throat> method, um, Mary Ellen mentioned that professional growers will sometimes use fumigates and such. And I know a lot of home gardeners want to stay away from any chemicals as much as possible. Well, one way of partially um, killing the organisms in your soil is soil solarization. Now that's a particular way of uh, covering your soil with uh, plastic uh, with, what's, and keeping the humidity in there at a certain level uh, and allowing the sun to essentially cook the soil beneath mm -hmm. that plastic and it's going to raise the temperature uh, to a certain degree depending on your soil type, your soil texture. And we're going to include in the supplemental material with this uh, particular class more detailed information about soil solarization but it can uh, go a long ways in helping you to control soil-borne pathogens you know, by doing soil solarization. So uh, consider that and mulch again as Mary Helen mentioned earlier, you're stopping that splattering uh, of the organisms from the soil to your plants. And talking about solarization, um, that is something that I will suggest to people if they have something like bacterial wilt. I mean, they still need to rotate, but um, you know, in conjunction with that, maybe solarizing that soil um, for things like um, these soil-borne diseases that we really don't have a treatment for in a home garden a lot of times. Um, but it's really important if you're going to solarize soil to do it correctly because you can end up with a greenhouse of grass underneath your plastic if you don't do it right. So you know, it's got to be prepared as basically like a seed bed have some moisture in there, not cloddy, flat, like you're gonna plant something, um, you know, clear plastic close to the soil and sealed on the sides for a number of weeks. So you gotta give up some time, planting time in your garden. And it's got, it needs to be in the hot time of the year. So like you just said, he'll put some resources up for you, but make sure if you're gonna solarize that you do it right. Yeah, that's real important. Otherwise it's uh, wasted time and wasted growing time if you don't do soil solarization correctly because you're not going to get the results that you're wanting. And uh, once again, I know Mary Helen's mentioned it several times, uh, that a lot of the pathogens, especially foliar pathogens uh, and fruit pathogens, uh, fungi in particular, bacteria, bacteria do not like to dry out. If they land on a leaf surface, uh, most bacteria if they can't get into that leaf pretty fast and it's dry conditions, they're not going to survive. Uh, fungal spores. When they land on plant leaf surface, uh, they can last sometimes for quite a while on that leaf surface uh, before they die. But they're not going to do anything unless they have actual leaf surface moisture there. I'm talking about water standing on the leaf. If they have water on the leaf, most fungal spores take at least two hours of, of wet leaves before they'll germinate. They can actually germinate and directly penetrate the leaf if they have that leaf moisture. So, irrigation, Mary Helen. Right. 
Don't Doing that properly it, will keep those leaves dry, right? That's right. Yeah. And you know, something else to think about in terms of this is if you have plants planted so that they're not getting morning sun, then you may have more disease pressure than if you had some morning sun because you have dew overnight and if those leaves are not able to dry out in the morning, um, you may get more fungal disease. So um, it's, it's helpful to have that morning sun exposure, even if you can get away with growing it with, it's in terms of total amount of light without that. Very true. I mean, think about it, class. Going all the way back to our botany class, uh, the soils class, how does a plant get water into itself? It takes the water up through the roots and then it's transferred to all parts of the plant. So what part of your plant needs water? Roots. So when you, if you're gonna irrigate, the best thing to do is to put it where your plant is gonna use it, in the soil at the root zone. Right. Now, watering the leaves usually will only lead to problems. And so, Mary Ellen mentioned it. If you don't have to overhead irrigate, do not overhead irrigate. And again, starting clean, staying clean, sanitation is important. We mentioned it, breaking the pathogen link by removing plant debris, by removing diseased plants, but also what else can transfer diseases from one field to another, one raised bed to another, your tools, even your clothing or your shoes. Right. So we often will see, so uh, bacterial wilt is, is a big problem in tomatoes. And I ask people when they have it, did you have tomatoes in the spot last year? Or have you had it there, had them been there in the past? And a lot, sometimes they won't have. And so it's a mystery, you know, it may be a new raised bed, new soil, um, a new container garden. But in that case, the best I can usually guess is that it came in on their tools or their shoes you know they they stepped in the bed wearing shoes that they you know they walked from another part of the garden so um, got to be careful about sanitation and y'all may think that um, just walking through a bed that had disease and walking to another one I can actually spread the disease well yeah think about it these beasties are trying to survive and they can to personify them they can be very very resourceful and if they can latch on to that little crevice in your gardening shoes and hang on for just the split time it takes you to walk from one bed to the other mm -hmm. you're spreading the disease so think about it sanitation is important keeping things clean so now we've covered the, the environmental link and we've covered the pathogen link, different ways of breaking that. So back to our soil, I mean our plant disease triangle. What's the third link that we're looking at? Our host. The susceptible host. So one thing uh, about dealing with plant disease that you really want to make sure you know is if you're growing a plant, what does a healthy plant look like? Okay, I have to admit, Marilyn, I've had people call and ask me what's why are the uh, plants on particular plant. This is not usually with vegetables, but I've seen I've actually had it happen with ornamental plants. They will wonder, you know, why are my leaves turning white? And then come to find out they're growing a variegated version of the plant. Right. So the healthy plant in this case has white leaves, white sectors in it with the green so it's really a really important to know what a healthy plant looks like uh, before you start deciding whether your plant is diseased or not right so you know one example I thought of um, you have some you around here and we um, one time I was working in the plant clinic and we got a, a root soil sample in from you and there were all these little nodules on the roots and of course we get nodules from nitrogen fixing bacteria on legumes so they're usually fairly large and and stuff um, we can get root knot nematode galls on roots and that is a disease root knot nematodes cause um, disease 
as some other nematodes do, but it was it was a mystery to me to see these little nodules on these U roots. And come to, come to find out, that is common, and that's it's a, you know it's not a problem. It's just kind of like with legumes, you have these associated bacteria. You had some sort of associated organism with you that would cause these little nodules on the roots. So, so in that case, the plant was entirely healthy. <laughs> it's just we didn't know what a healthy plant looked like. <laughs> so. Try as much as you can to know what your healthy plant should look like. I mean, that goes a long way, not just with diseases, but with uh, your plant nutrition. If you know that you're growing a particular pepper, say, and the leaves are very, very dark green, and you're growing another variety, maybe the leaves are a light, lot lighter, maybe paler green. Well, if you look at the two plants side by side, you may think that your pale green pepper plant actually is diseased or needing more nutrition or something like that but come to find out well that's its natural that's its healthy look it's not as dark green as, as the other varieties so okay. even not just the plant type but the different varieties can have different looks so knowing what a healthy plant looks like is real important and so now if you want to break the, that host link the host remember it has to be a susceptible host right. for plant disease to develop so we're not talking about the environment the plant's growing in or what pathogens it may be exposed to, but just is that host susceptible to diseases? And so what we're going to tell you now is different ways that you can break that host link. Uh, a couple of them we mentioned already. Remember, on crop rotation, uh, you're breaking the host link. Yeah. Uh, in that case, what you're essentially doing is removing the host from the whole picture. So if you remove that host, uh, you're breaking the link and you're not going to get disease. Right. And you mentioned another way other than crop rotation. Fallowing? Fallowing, yeah. Because you could have a conducive environment, a virulent pathogen present, but if it's fallow ground where nothing's really growing, you're not going to get disease. Now there could be cases where you have some weeds that grew up that would be host um, in certain cases, but in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one way. And of course the most effective way. Gold standard of disease management is resistant plants. So a lot of work is put into breeding plants for resistance to certain diseases. Um, I have a few, exam a couple of examples here. Perhaps a, a muscadine vine and we, this is native here. Um, it is either resistant or tolerant to Pierce's disease, um, bacterial disease caused by Xylella fastidiosa that will wipe out things like Chardonnay and Merlot um, over time, at least, uh, at least after some time, mm -hmm. once it gets exposed. So um, uh, in grape breeding, a lot of work has been put into breeding Pierce's disease resistant grapes that have the same qualities of the vinifera wine grapes. Um, and they do come out with some over time. Um, but our muscadine is generally either resistant or tolerant um, to that disease. And so that's one reason why we can grow these here and grow them very well in some cases. Um, have another example here from the garden is this is basil that has downy mildew. And I believe it was 2009 that mm -hmm. downy mildew of basil started showing up in Louisiana. Um, and it's unfortunately the sweet basil is the most susceptible, tends to be the most susceptible to it. Um, different cultivars of sweet basil. And uh, the, thing, the spicy basil tend to be more resistant, but that's sometimes not what people want to cook with. Um, within the past few years, there have been several varieties released by Rutgers University that are supposed to be of sweet basil that are supposed to be downy, mildew resistant. So they have names like Rutgers Passion or something, DMR, <laughs> downy, mildew resistant, DMR. Um, and I do not know that those have been tried in Louisiana yet, but uh, that is something to consider. So both growing species of plants that are resistant to a certain disease, um, or, or not even a host, um, mm -hmm. and growing varieties. So when you buy tomatoes, a lot of times you're going to see things like, um, it's, it's saying that it's resistant to Fusarium wilt, root knot nematodes, and verticillium wilt. Well, we talked earlier about we don't really have a lot of trouble with verticillium wilt, but if we don't have a variety that's resistant to Fusarium wilt, we may very well have trouble, and root knot nematodes as well. So if you're growing heirloom tomatoes, particularly, sometimes you may see Fusarium wilt 
which we don't typically see in a lot of our newer tomato varieties because they have some resistance to that. Um, we, uh, some of our tomato varieties now are resistant to um, tomato spot and wilt virus, which is a problem, but can be a big problem. One example I like to give for the landscape is, uh, it's kind of one of my soapboxes, is, you know, boxwoods tend to get, uh, boxwoods and um, Japanese hollies uh, tend to get uh, phytophthoras, particularly on boxwoods, um, and, and those, those two plants tend to get these root diseases, uh, not just phytophthora, sometimes nematodes, there's a black root rot that gets on Japanese holly. Yopon holly, um, dwarf yopon holly, so it's a cultivated variety of our native yopon, um, you know, made to grow into kind of a little shrub, similar to what a boxwood or a Japanese holly look like, don't tend to have as many problems. And so um, that, I think, is a good alternative in a lot of cases to growing boxwoods, to growing Japanese holly, particularly in places where you don't have good drainage. Very true. Very true. Now, I, I know we've told you this before, uh, but it bears repeating, is when you're looking at resistant varieties uh, of vegetables, which is you know, what we're concentrating on a little bit more in this class, <clears throat> use your seed catalogs. They will always tell you, I mean, it's a selling point. So they're gonna tell you the disease resistance that the particular varieties you may be looking at have. And somewhere either at the bottom of the page with each page, some catalogs have it at the very front, but there will usually be letters, like for vertebrates, psyllium wilt, a lot of times they'll use V, fusarium, they'll use an F, um, different things like that. They will use symbols or letters to indicate particular disease resistances. So use your seed catalog as a resource. Go through it, look at it, and when you're looking at a variety that you might want to grow, look in the description of the variety and it will tell you it'll have that little code that tells you what diseases it has been uh, bred to be resistant to or tolerant of as Mary Helen mentioned uh, tolerant that just means that you might see a little bit of disease on that particular variety or maybe the pathogens in there but it's not really causing any disease symptoms and so the plant will produce perfectly fine because it tolerates that disease's presence uh, and then, of course, there's total resistance where the pathogen can't set up house at all in the plant. So, now, having said that, um, you know, when we see things that are resistant, it doesn't necessarily mean entirely resistant. So, sometimes you may get some amount of disease, but not as much as you would. So, you have these, um, you have the complete resistance in some cases, and then you just have resistance by degree. And so, you may not you may get some symptoms but not as many symptoms very true and uh once again resistance may be something that as may helen said not total if you have plants and you're not giving them what they need you're not giving them a great environment to grow in then that resistance can in some cases break down uh, the plant isn't totally resistant once it gets stressed to a certain level so keep that in mind uh, growing your plants in a healthy environment is another way of breaking that host link because you're keeping the plant healthy and able to resist the diseases uh, Mary Helen's already mentioned using disease free seed um, getting in plants that are uh, free and this is one that hopefully will have another class for you later on this is uh, doing grafting grafting of vegetables uh -huh. that that has become well, I say become, it's become coming more and more uh, popular and used, especially by commercial growers in the U.S. Grafting of vegetables has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, I know over in some other countries, especially like over in Korea, 90% mm -hmm. or more of the cucurbits are grafted uh -huh. uh, because that's the only way they can uh, grow them. Um, as we talked about, resistant varieties, well, way many resistant varieties are developed it goes through a process of breeding and selecting breeding and selecting breeding and selecting and that can take time even with plants that regenerate and go to seed and reproduce very rapidly that can that can still take a lot of time a lot of investment but just think about it if you have a root disease that you're concerned with and you have a particular plant let's say 
we're talking about heirloom tomatoes. You have a tomato variety that is resistant to fusarium and verticillium and root knot nematode and Bacterial that's a problem. Will. That's, Bacterial. The, that's the big one that they've been able to find. Root yeah, they've actually found some root resistant uh, resistance. Will. And we don't have tomato in that. varieties, Correct. to my knowledge, that are resistant to bacteria. No, they haven't been developed yet. They're still breeding for them. But you can take that variety of plant, let's say in this case the tomato, you grow it and then you graft onto the root system, just like what you do with fruit trees. You graft the desired fruit producing part onto that resistant root system yeah. and in that case you can grow heirlooms in conditions where normally their roots would be devastated by a soil-borne disease and instead you're able to grow healthy uh, producing plants because you have a root system that's resistant and a top that's giving you the horticultural qualities you're looking for that's right. and that's also faster than breeding and breeding and waiting for it to develop. Right. Uh, the nice thing about that, um, I know Mary Helen and I have both done some vegetable grafting and, and it can be done even by homeowners uh, quite successfully. A plant breeder can then concentrate on breeding a variety of plant that has very, very good root resistance to diseases. Mm -hmm. And they don't care what the fruit that this plant sure. produces is like. It could, you could be growing a tomato plant that the fruit, for all intents and purposes, is inedible. Mm -hmm. It never gets ripe, it's small, it splits, it never tastes sweet. But you don't really care because all you're looking for is the rootstock that's resistant to diseases. Right. In the meantime, a breeder can be growing for beautiful, tasty, <laughs> luscious I love those adjectives. <laughs> Tomato fruits on this particular variety and they don't really have to concentrate on whether it has root disease resistance because they know that they can put this horticultural top onto resistant roots and you can produce uh, productive plants. That's right. It's a very cool idea and, and like you said they've done this in, in parts of Asia I believe for a lot longer. Um, Doing, doing it some here. There's a LSU Ag Center publication on the topic of tomato grafting if you're interested in that. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if you're going to graft a tomato, you know, normally you can plant a tomato and plant it quite deep. You know, you can plant the stem to some extent, but if we're going to plant a grafted variety, we want to make sure that this, mm. the scion part, the part that doesn't have a lot of disease resistance and that is going to produce the fruit that we want, we don't want it to have soil contact because that could negate some of the effects of that root stock. Yeah, so like I said, we're going to put together a class on grafting for you and um, hopefully <clears throat> you'll come back for that. Um, so going back again now, we've covered the disease triangle, uh, the different parts, different ways you can actually break that link and giving you a few specific examples, uh, but in almost all cases we talk about identify. And one way you can identify what type of disease you have is take advantage of uh, your plant disease clinic. We have one in Louisiana. Uh, I think virtually every state has one, if not uh, one uh, that is part of the state university system or the extension system. There will be f private uh, laboratories where you can send uh, samples to those labs and get them tested for diseases. Uh, the lab will, will do the test, they will determine what particular disease you have, if it is a disease, or they may tell you that it's an abiotic disorder. And when you get the report back, they'll actually give you recommendations of what you can do. So um, take advantage of your plant disease labs and clinics that are available. And actually, we're going to give you a little bit of a tour of the plant disease clinic at LSU. And Dr. Raj Singh is going to tell you about uh, what they do there. You're actually going to be surprised. It's uh, a little more complicated and high-tech than you may think, but they give you the answers, right. uh, which is important. Right. Getting the answers, getting the information. Right. And you know, there, there's a fee for sending plants to the clinic usually, and so if you want to send them to us at the local office, you know, in a lot of cases, either from a photograph or from the plant itself, we're going to be able to identify, you know, what that is. Mm -hmm. If we are not able to, then that's the time to send that to the clinic. Um, if, you, if, there, if we can look at signs and symptoms under a microscope or something, it's just 
result, we are going to be able to do that. But if you have to do uh, culture and artificial media, or if you have to do uh, DNA sequencing, which is quite often um, used in disease identification, then that's something that would have to be done by the diagnostic center. Yeah, so we hope you guys have learned something from the class. I want to thank Dr. Ferguson for coming down and uh, being involved. Uh, she's one of those experts that's available to you, an extension agent. So if you don't know about the extension service in Louisiana or in your particular state or area, check it out. There's a lot that they have uh, to provide for you and a lot of information they'll give you. And it's a good resource if you want to be a successful gardener.